Welcome back to Aspire to Lead for another wonderful interview with a phenomenal educational leader. I have Coach Jim Johnson with me. But before we get to our conversation this week, I'm going to just quickly let you know that on social media, I had the wonderful opportunity to announce that I'll be a keynote speaker at the Midwest Educational Leadership Conference in Breckenridge, Colorado. Super excited about this conference. In fact, so excited that I have one of the conference lead committee members joining me for a midweek bonus episode as we talk about the conference in more detail. So stay tuned for that information. But my keynote specifically is going to be on leadership capacity and and improving our mental health as leaders. The conference is June 17th through the 19th, so hopefully you head over to bit.ly slash M-E-L-C 2024 to grab your seat to this impactful event. Now let's get over to our conversation with Coach Jim Johnson, who is doing just some wonderful things in regards to his book. He speaks all over the country, and he's going to be sharing a story about a special student who had great success in a game, which led to a season of great success, and then also a coaching career where he's had a profound impact on the lives of so many. So stay tuned as we talk about his wonderful book, A Coach and a Miracle, as we dive into this story that was on national news, ESPN, ESPY's award, and so much more. Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire to Lead, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. All right, welcome back, Aspire Leaders and Teach Better Family. I am overjoyed with the guests that I have this week. You probably have recognized this man's name. You probably have seen him on social media, maybe even on news, um, as he has a brilliant story that he's going to be sharing today about a miracle game that really has inspired so many people across this country. And before we dive into who he is, what he is doing in education and, and with leaders and coaches, like I said, all over, Jim, thank you so much for being on Inspired to Lead. Thanks, Josh. I'm looking forward to this. Yes, it was brilliant to connect with you on social media and have a chance to speak with you. I have your book right here, and I'm so excited to talk about this wonderful resource, but then also about just how you're inspiring so many brilliant leaders across this country. But before we dive into your book and so many other topics, I would love, Jim, for you just to share a little bit about your educational and leadership journey. Absolutely. I was a uh, high school for most of my career, although I did hit uh, various levels as a physical education teacher. I coached a number of sports, but my main love was basketball. And I ended up being a, a coach of basketball for 35 years, 33 of them in the high school situation and two in college. And I, uh, I, my dream was to be a head coach. Uh, and I ended up being a head coach for 30 years of those 35 in four different high schools. Although I, I'll give, give you a quick story that uh, I make light of it now, but it wasn't so much fun going through. But I was a head coach at 25 years old at a school about 20 minutes from where I grew up. And I had been uh, a couple of years as a JV coach and we had done pretty well. And of course, I thought I had all the answers. And I did such a great job, Josh, that I led that team to 17 consecutive losses. And then I was on an interim position and I didn't like what the administration had to say to me at the end of the year. Of course, what they said to me is we're not going to renew your contract or you're fired, I guess would be another way to put that. <laughs> and it was a very humbling experience. But, you know, after reflecting on that, after being very bitter initially, it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because it made me realize that I had a lot to learn. And I started to really become a student of leadership and how I could be build teams. And number two is to put a burn, you know, is use those setbacks as comebacks. And that burn in my belly never went away. Uh, that For my next uh, approximately 30 years, mm -hmm. I really was driven to prove that I could be a, a highly successful coach. And fortunately, I was able to do that. And in my last 27 years, I was a teacher and a coach of the suburb of Rochester, New York, called Greece, like the country. Uh, that I went to high school. Actually, when I grew up, there were three high schools and I ended up going to one and, and ended up being a, a teacher and, and also the varsity basketball for boys for my last 27 years. During that, uh, I took over one program in Greece that was really bad and we fortunately were able to turn it around. We, our last three years was three of the best years in the school history. 
And then I moved over to the sister school for a lot of different reasons that, that uh, would bore your listeners. So I'm not going to delve into that. Uh, but fortunately, um, my last three years at the one school and then my last 20 years I uh, at my final school, we never had a losing season. So I finally wow. started to figure things out and we started to uh, do things and, and started to develop some processes and systems that helped us uh, become quite successful. I also uh, was blessed to be part of a story that uh, is about the book, A Coach of Miracle. I don't know if we want to delve into that uh, too yeah. much. But, uh, uh, be glad to share that and, and that venture as well. So I definitely want to touch on the book. I want to touch about that miracle game uh, because, I, like I said, if, if someone is watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast platform, they're probably like, you know, I've noticed this name before on a major news outlet. <laughs> I know you were on ESPN and you've made a lot of connections over the years. I mean, goodness sakes, the forward is by Billy Donovan. I mean, talk about uh, a basketball legend. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind just sharing, you know, maybe some folks haven't heard about, you know, this wonderful story um, that you share. I would love for you just to talk about this miracle game and kind of how it has impacted you <laughs> as a coach and your trajectory as a leader. Well, actually, ironically, I just met uh, today uh, with a person. I, I do some help with this or local organization for autism called Autism Up. We were reminiscing. This crazy thing is it was 18 years ago. We had the wow. anniversary on February 15th. So it's amazing that it's been 18 years. But I had this young man that tried out in our program. His name was Jason McElwain. The world now knows him as J-Mac, a nickname that I tagged him because I couldn't pronounce his last name. But for <laughs> He liked it uh, and it stuck. But J Mac is on the autism spectrum. And when he tried out for our program, he was very small in stature, maybe five, six, 95 pounds soaking wet. Mm -hmm. But he tried out for our junior varsity. I was the varsity coach. And after a couple of days of tryouts, my assistant came to me and said, Coach, we have a young man named Jason McElwain. He's on the autism spectrum. He's not a very good player. But man, he has a lot of the other ingredients we talk about in trying to bring the right people on our team, like being a we over me guy, being a guy that's very passionate and wants to get better. And so I, he said, I want to keep him in the program as a team manager. I said, well, great. That sounds like a guy that we'd like to keep around. So his sophomore year. Uh, he was served as a JV team manager, but he would come to, because in our format, we usually would play JV games and varsity games back to back. So he would sit on bench for both games and he would get so emotional during the JV game, which I would sit on the bench for part of it. And then uh, for the varsity game, though, it always warmed my heart because he, he would be what I call a tad disheveled in his white shirt and black tie that he wore in every game. But our varsity players would always go over, straighten him out, and then he'd be a little bit more calmer on the varsity because he wasn't around us you know, during practice every day like he was with the JVs. And to give you a sidelight, at that point, that was about my eighth or ninth year in coaching at Greece Athena. We had had quite a bit of success. We had winning seasons. We won a couple of divisions. But in our area, the Section 5 championship is kind of a pinnacle that we shoot for. And it's hard to win. I have friends that have been coaching for decades and have never won one. And that was my dream. Well, Jason's uh, sophomore year, we got to the sectional semifinal. Now for the fifth time in my career, and we lose in a very close game. And we're extremely disappointed. But what I really admire and something I think the listeners can take away in education is that, you know, teaching young people how to deserve a chance. And what was J different than Jason, because I mentioned I, I've been a coach or a head coach for 30 years. I rarely, if I, I had a young man try out for the team and didn't make it, would then try again. But Jason not only tried again. But he came to all our off-season workouts, and I started to really build a band. I was picking him up in his house, and I really admired his desire. And so his junior, he tries out for the team. And again, he doesn't make it, but now he's going to serve as the team manager for the varsity. And at our first team meeting, Josh, you, you get a kick out of this. I walk in, and he immediately raises his hand. I said, yeah, J-Mac. He says, Coach, we know you've never won a Section 5 championship. And I said, well, thanks, J-Mac, for the reminder. <laughs> and, uh, but this year, we're going to uh, adopt this mantra called stay focused, and we're going to help you win your first Section 5 championship. I said, well, thanks, Jay. Well, we had another really good season as junior. We get to the semifinals now for the sixth time in my career. And I think listeners can, you know, if you ever had that stumbling block that you don't feel like you ever get through. Well, that was mine. And we lose at the buzzer to our crosstown rival. We are devastated. 
But Jason, you know, one of the things I focus on is the art of, or power of perseverance. And Jason mm -hmm. was a great illustration of that. And so his, he comes back for a senior. Now, third time. I've never had a young man try out three times in a row without making it. And this time when he comes out as senior, I bring him in the office during tryouts. And I said, Jason, unfortunately, I've got some bad news. And he looks at me, he goes, what, Coach? He goes, it, we're, uh, you're not, still not quite good enough to team. Now he had uh, grown to be about five, nine, and he was up to about 115 pounds. So he's still pretty small. And he said, uh, but this year, because of your loyalty and commitment, and I think that's something we could all, you know, as we're teaching young people is teaching them about loyalty and community. I said, I want to give you a gift. And of course he perked right up. I said, well, he goes, what's the, what's the gift coach? I said, well, for senior night, which is where we honor our seniors before our final home game, I'm going to give you a uniform and hopefully get you in the game. Well, he was pretty excited about that uniform idea. In fact, periodically he would ask me about that uniform. And of course I define periodically as about every other day. He was pretty pumped up. Well, Interesting enough is that's his senior year, we were expected to have a very good team. We had almost uh, we had four starters returning. We had a lot of good players back. And we started the year off well. We won a tip-off tournament. We were 2-0, and then adversity struck. And it's in my book. It's too long of a story. But the bottom line is uh, the, is, the issue divided the team. And if anybody's ever been on a team that didn't get along, most likely you didn't reach – your potential and that we were no different. We lost three out of our next five games and I was beside myself. And the, again, going back to the power of perseverance, uh, I nearly resigned because we had so many issues. And I remember my staff and my wife coming to me and say, you know, Jim, you always talk about, you know, quotes every day, you know, and, and one of you always say is when the going gets tough, the tough get going, you know, you got to step up. And so I used all my leadership arrows that I possibly could. And the turning point that season was we went to a Christmas tournament. We were playing in a, the biggest school in Rochester. And in the opening round, we barely won. We were still struggling. And in the in second game, the whole school, Fairport, beats this team by like 40 points that we had barely beaten two weeks earlier. So it was during Christmas break. So we had actually a short practice during the next day uh, before we were going to play that night called the shoot around. And normally on a shoot around, we would bring basketballs out and we'd go over some sh uh, drills and go over some things to prep for the game. But I knew I'd do something different. So, you know, using my leadership arrows, it was running out of them in the quiver. I sat them down. We never brought a basketball out. And that's where I really showed him my vulnerability. Uh, first of all, I shocked him with my first statement. I said, guys, I don't want to go to the game tonight. And they looked at me in disbelief. I said, unless we decide that we're going to unite, Fairport's going to beat us by 50 points tonight. But the best thing I did and something I really try to help leaders with is that you have to be a better listener. And I said to him, I don't have the answers. You do. And as educators, we forget that. A lot of times your students have the answers if you listen. I said, you guys got to share on how we can unite this team. And I, I tell you, Josh, it felt like 10 minutes. It was probably only 30 seconds. Then finally someone said something and then somebody else said. And by the end of that meeting, I could tell things. It, it wasn't a panacea, but it, it really showed that some of the things that by them giving input and feeling like they had ownership, and it manifested that night. We played a great game, although we didn't beat Fairport. We lost them in overtime, and it showed what we could do. And we really uh, went quite well from there. We won eight over the next nine games going into senior night. Senior night was on February 15th. I gave Jay Mack his first jersey on February 13th. He was so pumped. Even though it was number 52, it was made for a post player, and he's 5'9", 110 pounds. It was swimming on him. But there was a rumor going around school, Josh, that he slept in it for two straight nights. He says he, he didn't, but uh, that uh, who knows? <laughs> but anyways, that, that night, I will always cherish to see him embrace his parents before the game. It, in uniform was a memory I will always have. And I, I got choked up just seeing that. Well, now the game begins. And we had a really good student body following that year called the Six Men. And of course, they, at the opening tap, they start yelling, we want J-Mac. I, <laughs> I forgot. Well, after three quarters of the game, I got everybody in. 
but Jason. So with just over four minutes to go, I thought the time is right. I turned, I pointed him. He nearly ran out of the court. He was so fired up. Then he walks on the floor for the first time. And our student body not only gives him a standing ovation, but what Jason and I didn't know, one of our parents had made these placards, these pictures of Jason's face. Little side story, we met President Bush later that year, and he's actually had one in the White House, so it was pretty cool. They show those placards, and I get so overwhelmed with emotion. I sit down, and tears start to roll down my face. I was profoundly touched. He's in his first game. First time he gets the ball, he's in the right corner, a three-point shot. He lets it go. The crowd stands in anticipation. It misses by like six feet. Now, I I kid people, but uh, many of your listeners are probably in the public schools, and you know in the public schools you're not supposed to pray, but I was praying. I was breaking the rules. Oh, sure. (laughs) It's going, dear God, please help him get one basket. Next possession, he actually has a much shorter shot from about 10 feet. He lets it go. And this time it hits the backboard and hits the rim. And the crowd groans. I'm thinking, all right, God's starting to listen. We're getting closer. (laughs) Third possession, he has another three-pointer from the right wing. This time he lets it go. Magic. It goes in. The place explodes. And I'm thinking, God must be a basketball fan. Not only has he scored, he's got a three-pointer. It can't get any better than this. Then the next possession, he makes another three. And before I close the story, I want to tell you, Jason's boyhood idol was the late, great Kobe Bryant. In fact, Jason used to sign his name, Jason J. Mac Kobe McElwain. I kid you not. That's how he did sign his name. Well, six months after that game, Jason, because of what he did in the game, which I'll share in a moment, is at the ESPYs Award for the greatest sports moment of the year. And one of the other four finalists is his idol, Kobe. Kobe has scored 81 points in the NBA game and he meets his idol and beats him out for the SB. Well, how does he do that? After he makes those first two shots, he makes another shot where his foot's on the line. Then he missed a couple and then he made another. And then he, the two things I'll never forget with a minute to go, tears still flowing down my face. I can't believe what I'm seeing. I get a tap on my shoulder. I look behind me. I'm shocked. It's J Mac's mother. She's bawling her eyes out, Josh. And she whispers in my ear, coach, this is the best gift you could ever give my son. What would you have done? If you heard that. Of course I cried harder. Yeah. I was going to say, you're already crying. <laughs> <laughs> then this is how the game ends. I, I kid oh. you not. Spend support on our opponent. I want to give kudos to their players and coach. They were great sports that night. They score with just under 10 seconds to go. And our po- player taking the ball out of bounds normally throws to our point guard. But for some unknown reason, he throws it right to J-Mac. So it's the only time J-Mac really was dribbling. And he mm-hmm. dribbles down the court. And I'm thinking they're just going to let him go in and make a short shot of layup. Oh, no. He pulls up like two feet behind the arc, almost an NBA three. I think, Jason, don't shoot from there. You're going to ruin the moment. He lets go this rainbow swish. I look over, our student body runs on the floor, our players run on the floor, and the only thing I can think is I'm living the movie Rudy, but this is really true. (laughs) And our players put him up on their shoulders, and he's got the game ball over his head, and our public address announcer comes on, because I had no idea how many points he has, and he says, J-Mac is the leading scorer tonight with 20 points, including six three-pointers. Wow. And uh, I, I, in fact, I, I, you know, I like math, and I immediately said, oh, my God, if he played the whole game, he scored 160 points. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, and there's so many lessons. I'll share one just that jumps out to give you the idea you know, because ultimately, you know, in teaching a class or teaching mm-hmm. a team, you know, working with a team as a coach is, you know, when you can teach them uh, the essence of teamwork. And uh, to me, that was the ultimate essence is the fact that I had never asked the four players to pass Jason the ball during that game. Yet in those last four minutes, Jason was the only one to shoot because he they kept passing the ball. In fact, mm-hmm. a little side let, I, I see Jason still all the time and I kid him, J-Mac, I'm still looking for your first assist. You don't pass the ball. <laughs> But there was so many things that, uh, you know, that really exploded from there. So Yeah. So, Jim, I know you talk, like I said before, all over the place in regards to just really trying to inspire folks. And I know you've got this overarching theme of realizing your dreams. And I would mm-hmm. love, you know, for my audience to hear from you because, you know, there are a lot of folks right now, they're, especially this time of year, they're, <laughs> they're trying to realize their dream in leadership as far as going to that next position that they yeah have been thinking about for quite some time and working toward. And so 
if they can just get a little inspiration from you today, I think that'd be a wonderful piece for them. So what is it that you're talking about in these presentations? And, you know, what are you doing to, you know, help folks realize their dream? Yeah. So for quite a while, I was a one presentation pony. I was, uh, I did a speech, as you mentioned, called Dreams Really Do Come True that I still yeah. share, although I, I do quite a bit now with leadership and, and team culture. Mm-hmm. Although I still share Jason's story. Yep. I just I have some other keys, but I'll share one that is a real overlap in both my leadership and my inspirational talk is that I think as a leader, and this is something that really woke me, I, I become a very avid reader. And I, when I started reading in my late 20s, and one of the books that really changed my life was a very popular book that probably most of the listeners, because he's uh, the foundation and still works a lot in education, and that's Stephen Covey. In oh, fact, sure. I, I, I have the a blessing to actually speak at a Covey uh, Global Leadership Summit. Unfortunately, Dr. Covey had passed away, but uh, mm-hmm. I did get to meet some of his siblings and family. Yep. Uh, but anyways, uh, the first thing I think uh, he talks about in that book is getting clarity about your own personal mission. Because I, I always kid leaders, and I think there's so much true. If you want to be an effective leader, the first person you got to be able to lead is yourself. And so I think getting clarity. And so that's one of the things I do talk to people is that you really got to have clarity. And so I, I share a few steps, but a couple of uh, ones that I think can help your audience is one is you got to consistently ask yourself this question. Why? will you put on this earth? Or if you're a person of faith like I am, why was, did God put you on this earth? And then the second thing is, is really getting clarity about what your most important core values, the things that you want to try to consistently live with. And then from there is really trying to put it into a succinct statement. And I'll give you my uh, personal mission statement because it helped me immensely because now I had a foundation of what I was trying to live my life. Now, by no means am I perfect. I've had my good days and bad days like everybody else. But my mission statement is to be an outstanding role model that makes a positive difference in the world by helping others make their dreams come true. And when I get clarity about that, it really changed my focus and my thinking of how I could become a better leader. And so I think that's the first thing is getting clarity of how you're going to lead yourself. The second thing is I, I talk a lot more uh, in my leadership is that if you're going to be a great leader, you have to build trust. And you know what? I do a leadership presentation. I've done them all over the country. And I often ask, is trust important in building a you know effective team? And everybody, 100%, there's no one that, that any audience ever had to said, no, trust isn't important. But then I challenge the audience when I say, well, do you, are you intentional of how you build trust with your team? Because that was one of the things after my disaster, my first varsity position, was that I got very intentional and I taught my staff, and these were our three keys to building trust. Number one, you have to consistently align your words and actions. Uh, Simple to say, often uh, we find leaders don't do that very consistently, but I really took a lot of pride in leading by example. And, you know, as simple as like one of my non-negotiables is that you had to be on time. In fact, we were big on being early because I think that's an important life skill. And as educators, yes, we got to teach math, science, phys ed, whatever it is. But life skills are are things they're going to take with them to be successful in life. And so but, you know, we would practice six o'clock in the morning. Uh, So, uh, you know, but I was almost always there at first. You know, I was there at 530, 540 at the latest uh, getting things ready for practice. Um, So you got to live what you say. Uh, Number two is that we wanted to build the foundation of our program on telling each other the truth. And Josh, for the listeners, I think it's really important. That is an art and science. And what I mean by that is the science is, yes, you, you need to tell the truth. The art is, is when you do it. And that's why you need to get to know your people. So there were some people I could call them out in front of the whole team in a practice and they could handle it. And it was a very powerful message. But I got to know my players well enough that some of them couldn't handle it. And so it was a one-on-one conversation. And so that's why I think it's an art and science with telling the truth. But I think it's a foundation. We would come down very hard on our players if they lied to us. That was something that we wouldn't tolerate because it breaks the trust factor. And then the third piece was, you know, I took over four programs that were all pretty bad when we took them over. Uh, and the first one, as I mentioned, it was a disaster. The other three were able to turn around. We had winning seasons by the second year at the at the 
latest. And the third thing is, is you got to catch people consistently doing the right thing. And one of the things I teach leaders is that means two things. One, you got to be very specific with your praise. Let me give you an illustration. If I said, nice job, Johnny or Susie, if I, it was a female, they like that, but they don't often know why are they getting praised? And what, what I always give an illustration of basketball, I would say something when I, I saw one of our young people dive on the floor for a loose ball. I say, Johnny, that was awesome how you dove on the floor for a loose ball. That's what championship players do on championship teams. Now he really gets clarity of our expectation. And I'll add uh, with that because, you know, I'm often asked, well, don't you critique as a, a leader? You absolutely do. But here's where I think people have issues is they make it about the person instead of the action. And so you critique the poor behavior, but you don't have to be so negative with the person. And doing that, I think you, uh, I think communication clarity is kindness. And so when you share what their situation is, what, what you want changed, to tell them what you didn't like, but also tell them and give them that picture of what you're looking for. Um, so not, not just yelling at them, Johnny, why did you do that? It's, Johnny, I didn't like that you didn't run back on defense. Let's do it again. Or sometimes I show it on video because as we often tell um, educators, the film doesn't lie. <laughs> so, you know, by, by so going through and, and, and showing, you know, this is what we like. This is not what we like. So they, they get the picture. I love that so much. I mean, as a leader and being successful and that communication is so key. So yeah. uh, I love the way that you're, you're sharing your feedback and, and being specific and not, and not really focusing on the person, but the actions is, is such a brilliant piece. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Jim, real quick, I want to make sure that, you know, people are are getting your resource. And I know there's a little glare on the screen here with, with the Colorado Sun here, but A Coach and a Miracle, um, for those who are watching on YouTube, such a brilliant book. And I want folks to understand, like, this is not just for those in athletics. This right. is leadership qualities. And um, I love, you know, a lot of the components that we're talking about today are embedded in this resource. And so I just wanted you just to have a, a chance to you know, give a quick synopsis of the book and, and why it would be beneficial for my listeners to, to pick it up as soon as possible. You know, the one thing that I do brand myself as is the power of perseverance that Jason really uh, mm -hmm. manifests in my life. Because I'll give you a quick side story and I'll come right immediately back to the book. The crazy thing is, is three and a half weeks after Jason's miracle night, he has now has to go back and be our team manager. And we win our first Section 5 championship because we had gotten so much um, publicity, media publicity. Normally for a championship game, we play in an arena downtown. The seat's about 10,000. But, you know, we're not a basketball hotbed. So usually, you know, for a championship game, you'll see three or 4,000. Sure. We walk in the arena that night, Josh, and we it, it sold out. There's 10,000 people oh. there. And we start that game, my first Section 5 championship game. And, and we do talk about this in the book. Mm -hmm. We're down 14 to 3. And the power of perseverance is something I learned as a leader. It took me a long time because I kept getting knocked on the head. Was that I had to be the rock when things were going bad. And I didn't do that very well until Jason's season. It was something I made a pact myself that I was going to be the rock. Because what was happening was during the postseason because I wanted to win that championship so bad. Has everybody ever felt that, right? Is that when things didn't go right, I didn't handle it well. And I've got to be the rock, but I wasn't. And so I handled that much better. Our team really, we ended up winning the game late and, uh, and uh, we actually made a basket about 20 seconds to go to take the lead and we ended up winning our first championship. Uh, and so the book is basically will take you through uh, the background. It'll dive into a lot more deeper details of the uh, essence of perseverance, of all the struggles we had as a team, and then uniting around JMAC, and then seeing uh, you know JMAC now having to go back to the team manager. I'm going to share a little story that I think you'll you'll get a neat thing about. 
So after that season, we got interviewed a ton. And, you know, often Jason and I would do interviews together. And it was always funny, Josh, because they would often after the season ask, hey, Jason, what was the best thing about your senior season? Of course, they were expecting him to talk about his game, right? He would always tell, oh, winning the Section 5 championship. There's no doubt about it. And of course, they would be stunned. But that just goes to show you why we wanted him in our program. He was such a we over me guy that that was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. Yet the funny part is, and as an educator, I think we can all appreciate the greatest thing that ever happened because Jason actually came back and volunteered in our program for nine more years after that. Oh, wow. We ended up winning six Section 5 championships. So as I kid people, for a small fee, I will run them out to you. <laughs> uh, but the... You know, people have asked me that question, and, and I, you know, I was fortunate. I was just inducted in the Hall of Fame, and, you know, I've been blessed with a lot of honors. But the greatest thing, without a doubt, was the fact that Jason's game was something that impacted me greater than anything I had ever done in coaching and in teaching, without a doubt. Well, I know you have another couple of projects here in the works, and I don't know how much you can share on, on this podcast, but I know you've got a couple of book projects, and then potentially a movie project connected to your first book, A Coach and a Miracle. So, you know, anything that you can share, I, I think our listeners would, would love to hear, you know, the, the next projects coming up for you. Yeah. So I actually, I'm definitely involved with two book projects, both based on leadership. One is where I'm actually going to just write a chapter and that one's definitely going to be done uh, late this summer. Uh, the other one is I'm working with a couple different educators and, and uh, working on a leadership book. So one of those is, is going to come to fruition. We'll see which one. But I want to talk about I have seven leadership keys that I talk about. I mentioned uh, clarifying your vision or your mission statement, how to build trust. Those are some of the ones that we talk about. And uh, we're focusing on trying to. Uh, make this book. The movie is interesting. I, I'm always a little appreh apprehensive because we did have a movie deal when it was first started and it unfortunately all fell apart. Um, but I have two um, directors that are very interested in uh, We've been having a lot of discussion. Uh, they, they're really excited to do this. So I don't have a lot of details because there's still things, a lot to be done. But uh, sure. uh, I'm really, uh, you know, everybody has their bucket list. And uh, my bucket list before I leave this uh, earth, I'm really hoping that I'll be blessed to see a, a movie of, of this because I think it would just impact so many people in a positive way. The story and how all things came up, you know, the funny thing is, you know, Jason three years didn't make the team and then he has this magical night. That was my 19th season before we won our first section five championship. So, wow. uh, I, you know, I think it's something to really look. And I always give a sidelight that, you know, one of the people that inspired me was the late great John Wooden, the UCLA mm -hmm. coach. Yep. And, and, you know, for people that follow basketball, probably know that, you know, he won 10 national championships in 12 years. That's a pretty good run. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, is that was his 16th season at UCLA before they won the first one. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the power of perseverance is. is yeah, so. it's huge. No, and I think, you know, being a coach myself prior to, you know, in a lot of different sports um, yeah. and then becoming an administrator, I think there's just so many key qualities that translate from the coaching field to, you know, running a building. And I love your book. I love what you talk about in regards to leadership qualities and then also like team building and culture. Definitely check out Jim's book. Before we end our conversation there, Jim, I, I love the stories that you're providing and I appreciate everyone that's listening this week, but I want them to do something with this knowledge, right? An actual step. So if you could just real quick, you know, for our aspiring or current leaders, if there's something they could do tomorrow or next week to enhance your leadership journey, what would you recommend them do? You know, I'm going to give you two little things that, yeah. that I think are powerful. So the first thing is, I just think in the world right now, we have to go back and focus on leader, being a better leader, on, on sharing kindness and spreading kindness throughout the world and making it, it better. So my first point is about the kindness aspect is something I, I started doing about a year ago. And I think it's really been a powerful thing is that I send out at least one personal video. It's not uh, some major production. It's on my cell phone. 
Um, but it could be somebody, a friend of mine's birthday. It could be just a check-in. It could be, you know, I'm an avid reader, so I might recommend a book that I've been reading or, you know, a podcast that I'm listening to or whatever it happens to be. So I, I really would encourage our leaders is, is to reach out. And, and because video is so big now, it, and the funny thing is when I learned the idea, because we see so much video, obviously you have a podcast is on video, right? But how many times have you gotten a personal video from somebody? For me, very rarely. It doesn't happen. So it's just a way that you can show people you care and spread that kindness uh, by, by checking in with a, just a short video. And then I, I want to give you a bonus because you talked about communication, which is one of my other keys. I, I actually have a uh, accountability partner. We do a call every week. And one of the first things we do is this little exercise that I found to be very powerful in helping people be a better communicator. It's called the random word exercise. And simply what it is, is you could give me any word, Josh, or I could do the same. So we, we do each a word for each other. We don't know what the word is. And then you, because I brand myself, I'm being an inspirational leader to help people with perseverance to overcome obstacles. So that's my brand. So when I hear the word, the objective is we have 45 seconds. We try to get right on and we've practiced it enough. So we're pretty close to that. And the rules are this, you got to use the random word three times, at least during the conversation for 45 seconds. And then what I encourage people is to do it something along what you want to do, because I want to inspire people. So I try to make it an inspirational message. Now, you know, you, you could do anything you want as far as that. But what I found is it's a great way to think on your feet and be able to share a message because you don't know it's coming. But it's helped me so much because I, I do a lot of professional speaking. And, you know, there are times that, you know, you forget something you want to say or whatever. But, you know, just doing that has really built my confidence that I know I could uh, get that. And then the last thing I'll share is that remember, with working with your students on uh, that. They need to be inspired every day. So make sure that you you come, I call it as a leader, become a chief storyteller. Find stories that can inspire your st uh, students both in a positive way, but also those lessons. You know, like I used to do that a lot with my team. You know, I bring up a story about, you know, so-and-so that this is not what we want, or this is exactly what we want. But I, I really encourage educators, you know, share good stories because people remember stories and it's a great way to help people. Yeah, storytelling is so powerful. And you had asked when I got a video message, I got one from the wonderful Jim Johnson uh, <laughs> my way and uh, made my day. So, yes, there's a very powerful piece there. So everyone that's listening, uh, I, I can talk firsthand that that strategy <laughs> works. And I appreciated that video that you sent. So, Jim, I want everyone that's listening to connect with you as soon as possible. So how may they either, you know, find more on a website or connect with you on social media? Sure. So CoachJimJohnson.com, that way I wouldn't forget it as I've kidded you. And on that, uh, there we have a lot of free things. We have a uh, monthly newsletter you can sign up. We have a weekly blog that I do, mostly based on life and, and leadership type things. I do have a YouTube channel at Coach Jim Johnson where I share a lot of different uh, messages as well. I also uh, part of a uh, podcast called the Limitless Leadership Lounge where our goal is to help young and emerging leaders the way I could give back. Because as I mentioned, uh, when I was 25, I failed miserably as a leader. So I want to give back uh, to young and inspiring leaders. Uh, and then uh, also, if people, you know, we have all the contact information, if people want to reach out, I'd be glad to uh, give uh, my personal email just because uh, I love helping people. Uh, it, it's uh, JJ Hoops, JJ H O O P S at rochester.rr.com. Uh, there is another uh, email on the website. If you reach out that uh, my manager gets that, but she passes on to me. But uh, I, I do respond. Uh, I'm here to help people. And if I can help you either one-on-one -on -one or uh, with one of my messages to uh, 
to one of your groups. Uh, I, I love trying to help support people. And you can, of course, order the book on the website. We have a discount right now. And I also got, uh, I throw in a free bookmark on some of the uh, topics we talked about today. Oh, and I see you. Josh has got it. He's got my I got it. I'm, I'm with you, Jim. I yeah. got everything. <laughs> so yeah. this is the bookmark. Very inspirational. So I will, of course, have all of the links on joshamber.com as far as the website, email for Jim, and then, of course, the social media handles, whatnot. Um, you can also find that if you're on a podcast platform in the show notes. So make sure that you're checking those out connecting with Jim as soon as possible. And then of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the book, you can see the bookmark, you can see all the books behind Jim because he's an avid reader <laughs> and all his memorabilia. Thank you for those who are checking out on YouTube, either at Joshua Stamper or on the Teach Better Team YouTube page, both growing communities. Thank you so much for not only watching, but I hope that you subscribe to those channels. Jim, I want to thank you so much for just connecting. You are so inspiring. I, I have learned so much from you in just such a short period of time, but then also for you getting on Aspire to Lead and sharing so many wonderful pieces for our aspiring and current leaders. Thank you, Josh. I, I want to tell you that I really admire the work you're doing and I uh, highly recommend that uh, you know, people listen to your podcast because it, it's uh, a great way to help leaders become better. And as I always tell people, everybody wins when the leader gets better.